Thanks for joining me today. I'm Phil Eakins. I am a senior solutions architect here at AWS. And today I'm going to be talking about your SQL Server workloads and how to migrate those into AWS. Um, a little bit about PaaS. Um, if you have not had the opportunity the, to attend either the local groups or the local SQL Saturday events, I would encourage you to do so. So those are great community resources, uh, free training, good topics of uh, presentations, um, great networking opportunities in your community. Um, and also on the online side, we have our, our webinars, our marathon webinar topics, and also our virtual user groups. So if you can, if you have an opportunity to check those out, please do so. And volunteering, if, you, you know, if you're already attending these events or you're new to attending these events, you know, as it's a community-driven event, our, your volunteering is a great way to become more involved in either SQL Saturday or the past summit itself. So please check those resources out, much appreciated. A little bit about myself, I am a DBA. I say I started working with SQL Server back in the late 90s. Um, SQL version seven was the first version I, I worked on. And I've been an active DBA in various industries, you know, through today. Session evaluations, these are, are huge for myself as an, all of us speakers to understand what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, how we can improve and, you know, getting your honest feedback. Uh, but also past the organization, just to understand, you know, the topics that have been selected, the messaging you're receiving, you know, does that align with what you need? Is there other things you'd like to hear about? The session evaluations are all great ways to do that. So for this session and you know every session you get the opportunity to attend, please do you know, use that uh, session session evaluation link. And if you get those turned in by Friday, November 20th, um, that would be much appreciated. So session. Today, I'm going to be talking about you know SQL Server migrations, obviously. I'm going to start at a high level and discuss what are your options for running SQL Server in AWS, just at a high level, it's to level set, and then we're going to jump right into migration strategies. I'm going to talk about the SQL Server native offerings that you will probably have some understanding of, but I'm also going to bring into those AWS offerings that can work in conjunction with those native migrations to give you a you know a, a solution that takes on the best of both worlds. I'm also going to talk about some of the uh, native AWS tools we provide for migration and how they can be of assistance. And then I'm also going to kind of take the step into a modernization conversation. Some of the tools we offer to if you're looking to move your SQL Server workloads into, you know, uh, non-commercial and open source, uh, Amazon Aurora, down the road. Some of the tools that can be used for migration strategies, but also a modernization approach. First, let's talk about the why. You know, why you know, why migrate your workloads to AWS? Obviously, you know, there's the ongoing availability and high reliability of the AWS infrastructure, the 77 availability zones, the 24 regions, um, all the benefits of that infrastructure. Uh, but at migration level, migration experience, we have over a million active customers, many large brands have leveraged us for um, their migrations, um, database migration services, which is one of the tools I'm gonna talk about today has had over 300,000 database migrations into production. Um, and the tools we're gonna to talk about are, comp you know, are comprehensive and mature. There, you know, lots of customers have used them as I just alluded to, um, and they're gonna be here to help you with you know, resources such as our partner networks. We have over 80 Microsoft certified partners, ISVs, who can help you if you need architectural advice and you know, how do I size this architecture in AWS to meet what I currently run on-prem today? Um, or if you need more hands-on, if you need hands-on keyboards, just to, you know, to get the migration to be as successful, you need more resources. We have solu you know, partner solutions. We have our professional services organizations to provide those additional resources to help in the migration effort. And then finally, we also have programs and services to you know, use credits to help in that transi transitional period where you're in the middle of a migration and there's you know, costs involved and we have credits that can help and help accelerate that cloud journey. Um, a great customer I wanted to talk about is Click Software. They're based out of Massachusetts. They provide software that allows for the scheduling and dispatching of field service techs. Um, this is a very um, sensitive application from a concept of downtime. You know, their customers can be losing $100,000 an hour if there is not you know, if the application is not available. So when they were looking to migrate those workloads 
into AWS, that was a primary concern for them. So they were able to leverage the database migration service and move hundreds of their SQL Server 2008 R2 workloads into AWS on EC2. And in doing so, they were able to maintain that uptime that was critical to their end customers. So options for deploying SQL Server on AWS. So we have, we have two. We have our managed or Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS for SQL Server, and we have EC2. So on the managed service, we're gonna have a session later that's gonna talk about this in more detail, so I'm just gonna cover this at a high level. But conceptually, you have what I consider tasks that are customer facing and tasks that are not. If you're running a backup for a customer, they're very appreciative that we're doing backups, but it's not directly customer impactful. As opposed to creating a new report, working the developer on new functionality, adding an index that's gonna make that report run faster, those are all business value tasks. The customer sees direct impact of that time. So if you have limited DBA resources and you want to leverage them for those customer impactful tasks, then being able to remove you know, the patching considerations, configuring your HA, you know, um, the offerings that a managed solution gives you, it allows you to free up your DBA's time to work on those more co customer impactful events. Or if you don't have any DBA house, you know, in-house knowledge, the managed solution allows you to simplify your administrative, administrative overhead by using that managed solution. Um, there are some limitations with a managed solution in terms of security. You know, where, you know there are some, you don't have the ability to OS, you know, to log into the OS. You don't just have sysadmin rights at the database level. So there are some give and take as part of using a managed solution. Um, and that's where I have EC2. EC2 is the, the opposite where it's self-managed. You have local administrator, you can RDP into the OS. Um, you have sysadmin at the SQL Server level, you can you know, install your own binaries. You have full access to do what you used to today. You know, roll your own backups, set up your own HA, you know, configure any you know, read replicas, you know, whatever you need to do, you have full access to configure that. So that's the other side of you know, EC2 which is you know, the self-managed configuration. Feature-wise, so within RDS, we're, we only support SQL Server versions that are still actively supported by Microsoft. So I'm meaning 2012 through 2019. The 2008 as it's past extended support has now rolled off. So 2012 through, through 2019 is what RDS offers. On the EC2 side, we say all with an asterisk. Uh, if you have the install media and the appropriate licensing um, and an OS that allows you to run that software, you can bring any version you like. If you've got 2005, 2000, you know, you've got a number of offerings. Um, obviously, when you hit 2000, there are some OS limitations, but I do have some additional programs I'm going to talk about later in the session that will address how you can get around that. But again, if you have the binaries, you have the licensing appro appropriate, and you have the means of running it, you can bring any version of SQL Server you'd like to EC2. So what about additions? On RDS, we have the main four. We have Express, Web, Standard, and Enterprise. Um, the noticeable different missing piece there is Developer Edition. Within RDS, we can offer a Developer Edition license, um, but on EC2, you can go and download the Developer Edition and install that on the OS yourself. Um, so we see a, that's the scenario where we see a hybrid configuration on a pretty regular basis where customers will migrate their production workloads to RDS um, because they're looking for that managed service. Um, but they will potentially migrate a lot of their non-production workloads into the EC2 model, um, either on Windows or Linux, because they're looking to leverage that developer edition and save on the licensing cost there. So that's a pretty common strategy. You know, the best of both worlds, the managed solution for production, but leveraging that developer edition licensing costs for non-production on EC2. High availability within RDS, it's very much console driven. You select in the console when you're deploying RDS, I need high availability. Um, depending on the version and edition you select, it, it may be mirroring if you're using an older version of SQL Server like 2012. Um, if you go 2016, you know, various things, whatever version you pick, it's gonna give you the appropriate high availability. Um, but Behind the scenes, the managed service is configuring the cluster. If it needs availability groups, it's configuring the witnesses. So you don't need to worry about the complexities of configuring that. You just get to expo you get exposed to the benefits of a synchronous commit and automatic failover. Um, now on the EC2 side, 
like I said, you have local admin administrator, you have sysadmin, you can install and configure any, you know, any situation of high availability. We offer shared storage for a failable cluster instance. No. So you have a number of options that you're used to today. But again, it is self-managed. You have to worry about the patching, the configuration, you know, the health of that system. That's, you know, that is the self-managed model. Uh, we do, you know. So um, from a backup standpoint, we do offer automated backups. So when you configure the console by default, it does drive level snapshots uh, once a day. Um, and you can elect to use those and you configure your backup schedule or you can use um, native backups in RDS as well. On the EC2 side, you have a number of options. You can roll your own in-house, you can use maintenance plans, um, you can leverage third-party tools such as Howling Runs, etc. cetera. Um, or you can use the Volume Shadow Copy service through our AWS backup solution. Um, if you need to use TDE support, obviously with 2019, that is now a standard edition feature. So you can leverage that on RDS or EC2. Um, it's an enterprise if you need to be on 2017 or lower. Maintenance-wise, you do in RDS, you do define your maintenance windows and your patching windows and backup windows. So when a, when an OS patch is available, it uses that window you've defined to do the OS patching. Um, on the SQL side, it lets you know when a new CU is available. Um, you can defer that patch if you wanna make sure it's being fully tested in your lower environments first. Um, but then when it's actually executed, the managed service takes care of actually running that CU update. You just define when it runs and we take care of the actual patching ourselves. On the EC2 side, it's self-managed. You, know, you need to roll your Windows updates. You need to run, roll your CU updates, just as you're used to today. Licensing wise, on the RDS side, we only offer a license included model. What that means is the, the rate you're paying per minute for RDS includes uh, you know, a portion for a Windows license you know, and a SQL Server license. If you only run the RDS instance for 10 hours a month, you're paying that portion of the licensing. Um, on EC2, we do offer the same license included model, but we also offer a bring you on license, a BYOL option. The BYOL option does have some caveats, but um, if you have software assurance, if you do not have software assurance, we have a number of different licensing models and flexibility to allow you to bring those licenses to AWS. Um, component wise, you know, we have analysis services, tabular, SSIS, SSRS on the RDS side of the fence. Um, and EC2, you can, you know, you have the media, you can install whatever components you want to attach to your EC2 footprint. So let's jump into the migration services strategies. Now, the first question you need to ask is, you know, your assessment, you need to understand what you have. So inventorying your SQL Server dependencies, do you have CLR you're running that you need to leverage, which has some limitations. Do you have ODBC drivers you need to install? Obviously with RDS, you don't have access to the OS to do any of those ODBC driver installs, so that can rule something in or rule something out. Um, understand your authentication requirements. You know, SQL is supported, Windows is authentic, supported. Do you have any um, specifics you need to account for and document? Versions and additions, like I talked about with transparent data encryption, TDE, if that's the only reason you've been running enterprise licensing and you, know, you don't need to worry about resources, then perhaps this is an opportunity as part of your migration to move off enterprise and maybe move on to standard. And now that's in 2019 standard is supported with TDE. So that's a consideration as part of that migration. You know, what I have today, does that make sense for tomorrow? And then understand what licensing options you have, you know, what licenses do you own? When did you buy them? You know, what are the particulars? And then understand if a license included or a BYOL is the better option for your the specific workload. And again, the same answer is not gonna be true for two workloads. So as you rehab these conversations with different workloads, you know, start from the beginning and evaluate all these different elements because some workloads will lend themselves to RDS, some workloads will lend themselves to EC2, and it all comes down to you know the specifics of the use case. Then understand your high availability, understand what your SLAs are for your customers, your recovery point objective, your recovery time objective. Understanding those elements allows you to select the appropriate high availability construct within AWS and also you know, your disaster recovery architecture. So document those requirements and then we can make sure we architect the right solution to, to meet them. And then performance requirements, you know, understand, you know, what is your current workload looking like in, com in compute, in the CPU and memory? Um, how is your storage performing? You know, what storage tier will you need 
for AWS. So these kind of metrics are all relevant in you know, scaling the right architecture to meet this migration target. And understanding your retention policy if you're using automated backups within RDS or you're rolling your own native backups to, and then you're pushing to S3. Understand the different elements in your retention policy to make sure you're, you know, you're not having any surprises in terms of your backup retention policy and strategies. And then understand your migration options. We're going to talk about a number of those options today and you know, understanding what they are and how they lend themselves to certain use cases will help you pick the, the appropriate strategy for the appropriate workload. And then at the database level, just understand, you know, do I have recovery model requirements? You know, um, is there a compatibility level that has to remain at a certain point for vendor compliance? You know, understand those different elements and understand what you can move and what you can't change and, and test accordingly. And then finally, have a, a, a skill assessment. Understand, you know, internally you have your team been supporting failover cluster instances for years, lots of expertise. Uh, does that mean that failover cluster instances maybe is the right solution for AWS? Perhaps, perhaps not. Um, but understanding what skill, ga skill gaps you have allows you to make sure you have the appropriate training in place to fill that skill set gap before you migrate. If you decide, you know, availability groups is perhaps a better solution moving forward. You can understand all those different elements. So let's jump into some of those native solutions. First and foremost, native SQL Server backups and restores. It's, you know, it's the bread and butter of our DBAs. You know, I'm sure most, most if not all of your DBAs are already rolling some kind of a native backup solution. Um, but that gets you, you know, you're familiar with how to create your backups on-prem. Um, you're obviously familiar with how to do a restore, but there's an interim step there. How do we get our files from our corporate data center into AWS and which area of AWS do we need to move them to? RDS needs their backups to live in S3. EC2 needs their backups to be on a Windows share, be it local, local disk on that EC2 instance or a, a, you know, Amazon FSx, our managed file server. So some understandings there. So we have our command line interface that allows you to select a file and push it up to S3 or pull it down from S3. Um, that is much, that's a, a manual process, but it does allow you to you know, push files where you need them to, you know, be it, already, you know, be it um, S3, and then you can pull it from S3 down to EC2 if you would need to. Now, data sync is more of an automated solution. You identify your source um, directory structure. That's probably where you're writing your backups to today on-prem. And when you've identified that source, you can also identify the target you want to replicate those files to. Um, the target could be an S3 bucket if you're leveraging RDS. Um, it could be, you know, like a managed file server, like we talked about earlier, or just a local drive on an EC2 box. You can, you know, determine your target based on what database platform you need to do a migration to. Uh, but that is an, more of an automated fashion as files appear as as you roll your T log backups. Data Sync will recognize those new files and push them across to your target location. Um, we also have uh, AWS Transfer, which you know exposes the secure FTP protocols. So if you have customers that want to, you know, that want to push their backups up, that will roll that file into an S3 bucket. So it's just another a manual process, but a different means of getting your native backups into an S3 bucket within AWS. And then our finally our AWS Storage Gateway. So our Storage Gateway is a machine that you can run on-prem or in EC2 in AWS on EC2. And this has local disk attached, a local cache effectively, and it exposes that through a UNC path. So when you're writing your backups within you know, Management Studio, you can use that UNC path and effectively create a local backup, local in on-prem, um, local in, East, in um, AWS if you're already in there. Um, but when you have these backups written to your local disk cache, the storage gateway then will, behind the scenes, facilitate pushing all these files up to S3, um, and it will make it, make tuning elements based on the size of the file for the most appropriate way to push it into S3. So that's the storage gateway. End product is your files are in S3. And then once you have your files in AWS, you can determine the next step of your migration strategy. So we've talked about moving those files across the wire effectively. Uh, what if we're talking much larger files? We're talking you know, terabytes, per petabytes, if we have very large databases and we have you know, backups and supporting files that we need to move across, sometimes the wire isn't appropriate. You know, um, perhaps the, you know, your connection is 85% utilized, utilized to support your production systems 
and we don't want to you know, take that last 15% to handle a migration copy that may have a detrimental effect to your customer production experience. We don't want to create production issues as part of a migration effort, obviously. So using the, the Snow family of devices, the Snow Cone can fit in your mailbox um, up through the Snowmobile, which is a, a truck that's gonna arrive at your data center. Um, you can use these, you go into the console, order the device, it shows up at your data center. Um, you plug it in, you copy your, you know, effectively your seed databases, your, your native backups with compression turned on, hopefully, uh, whether you're crossing the wire or doing it to a physical device, you know, compression is a key part of using that just to make sure you're using the, moving the small amount of file possible. Once we have that defined, we copy our files to that um, Snow device, and then either, either it generates a shipping label and we ship it back to AWS, or the truck drives off and goes back to AWS. Um, in those scenarios, that allows us to get that seed database, the initial full backup to AWS. But in the, in the same time that we're doing that, we're gonna to want to have our, probably our T logs also copying out to AWS in preparation for our next step of migration. So we can use the, the Snow device to do that seed, but we can also leverage some of the strategies we talked about in the earlier slide to handle those T log copies, whether it's data sync or you know, a CLI wrapped in a PowerShell perhaps. You, know, you can use the T logs through the wire and you can use multiple different strategies to get your data into AWS as part of that migration preparation. Use cases, as we talked about, you know, it may be cost prohibitive to push all that data across the wire. Um, you, know, you may need other, you know, obviously the security considerations that snowmobiles are fully encrypted and that may be a consideration. Um, and say, used in conjunction with a number of different solutions to get your data out of the de snowmobile device into an S3 bucket in AWS's preparation for your migration. So SQL Server log shipping, it's a pretty common migration strategy. It's not obviously not real time, but it's very commonly used. Now within the world of EC2, we can support your native SQL Server log shipping, meaning you can use the wizard within the management studio to configure your log shipping. Um, if you have you know, custom scripts you already have, you can roll those, just define your source and targets and such. And that all will work just fine. Um, pretty simple and native offering. Um, now in the RDS world, we can create an equivalent, but we don't obviously because the backups need to be staged in S3, we can't use the wizard as it stands. But what we can do is use a combination of perhaps PowerShell and the CLI commands that we've talked about to you know, automate the copying of our you know, files into an S3 bucket. And then on the RDS side, when we do the restore operation, there is a custom procedure we will need to use specific to RDS. So we'll need to write some T-SQL jobs or some other scripting to pull that file down from, you know, recognize it's been written to S3 and then restore that with no recovery as part of our log shipping effort. So native slash hybrid, um, some require some scripting, but you can see how you could do a log shipping solution on RDS with a couple of extra scripting steps. Um, log shipping, you know, it's a known quantity. It's leveraging the existing backup strategies you're probably already doing. Those, you know, we're not creating any additional workload for your production systems because the production systems are probably already creating the full backups, already creating the T logs. And that's part of our ongoing goal here is to not put additional workload on production unless you absolutely have to as part of our migration strategy. So transactional replication, this is what I would say, not a traditional migration strategy, but it has some use cases. If you have, you know, going back to 2008, 2002, there are some version limitations. You can do a direct restore to 2017, but if you're looking to move to 2019, there's an extra step in there. Um, but with transactional replication, you're doing data at the table level, and that kind of bypasses some of those version restrictions as you're just moving the underlying data and not attempting to do a restore. Um, within the EC2 and RDS platform, EC2 is fully supported. You can you know, define an EC2 instance as a subscriber and you know, the usual caveats for transactional replication in terms of pr primary keys, et cetera. You can define your publications and push data across to that subscriber on EC2. Now, Amazon RDS does not support transactional replication in the context of objects being created on the RDS instance, but you can leverage it in, in a push subscription. So you can define the RDS instance as a subscriber in the context of a push subscription. So the publication can still push 
the underlying data directly to RDS. So that in that scenario, we can make transactional replication work with RDS. Um, is this a good use case? Um, typically, if you already have transactional replication configured for your production systems, and you're just adding potentially one additional subscriber, it's a consideration because again, we're going down the path of not adding additional workload to your database, um, and we can leverage RDS or EC2 as a subscription. If you don't have you know, that footprint already in place of transactional replication for your production systems, there are probably better solutions to implement for a, mig a migration strategy, uh, native backups being the simplest, but there are others we're gonna talk about, but just some different solutions to solve different problems. So what about availability groups? You know, if you already have an availability group presence in your on-prem environment, you already have a HA presence, we can leverage that to you know, facilitate replicating that data into AWS. We can add an additional third e node, an EC2 node in AWS. We can add that to the Windows cluster and add it to the availability group. Um, here we go back to you know, our prior conversations. We have to you know, provide that C database to add that. Um, you know, if that's a larger file, we look at our you know, command line interface utilities or we look at our snowmobile options. You know, we can leverage some of those SQL native solutions to get that initial seed done and then leverage availability groups to get, you know, catch up with the data as it moves forward. So a number of options there. In, and you know, we're leveraging obviously an asynchronous commit with a manual failover between our corporate data center and AWS. Um, but as we get ready to do a migration, we can you know, switch that over to a synchronous commit you know, and for a short period of time and then do our failover into AWS, making for a, you know, a seamless failover for our customers as we do the migration. In this scenario, I only added one node. Um, obviously, you know, we're talking enterprise features here because we're adding multiple you know, replicas. Um, but I could have added a second if I wanted to create a HA presence in AWS right away as part of the migration. Um, when you start adding additional nodes, you know, there are license considerations we need to be aware of. Um, you're adding additional nodes that you know, are not gonna be around long-term potentially. So we need to make sure your licensing is correctly in place. And in this situation, we can use a number of our different licensing models. We can use license included if we have that third node that's only around for a short period of time. And then when we migrate to it, then we start retiring boxes potentially in our corporate data center and freeing up actual licenses that we can BYUL into EC2 and kind of switch out those boxes. So license included is a great way to be creative and making sure you're correctly licensed for your, during your migration strategy, but then switching boxes back out to a BYOL model, you know, when you're, when you're done with the migration and those licenses become available. So a couple of different options there. Um, some of the limitations here are because we're leveraging the same cluster, the same availability group, you know, we need to mirror the OS, we need to mirror the um, SQL Server version and addition, so we don't have the ability to do any upgrades there. Um, but it is a pretty straightforward way of configuring that. Now, there are some other considerations and I'm gonna jump into the next slide and we're gonna talk about those. So our distributed availability group. Here, you'll see on the left side, we still have our corporate data center. We still have our two nodes, highly available, active, passive, you know, synchronous commit, automatic failover. But on the AWS side, we've built a separate cluster and a separate availability group configuration. By doing so, we're exposing ourselves to, if we wanted to add an upgraded OS on the AWS side, you know, or an, and or an upgraded SQL Server version. So we could go from, you know, Windows 2012 R2, SQL 2016 on our corporate line, but we could create an environment that is, you know, Windows 2019, SQL 2019 in our AWS side. And as part of that distributed availability group, we're pushing the data across and preparing for an upgrade in conjunction with our migration. Um, in this scenario, we would have to do a forced manual failover, but we can you know, move over to the AWS architecture and immediately have our HA in place, in place whilst also accomplishing our upgrades that we wanted to do as part of that. Um, other design considerations here is when you're using a traditional availability group, if you added two, two additional nodes, each of those nodes would be replicated to independently. So if you had your primary replica, it would send the transactions to node one in AWS. It would also send transactions to node two in AWS. Um, 
Within a data center, that's not necessarily the worst thing, uh, but in the world of cloud, where we're pushing those transactions across the wire, you know, doing double or triple the volume can be costly and can be you know, an, an undesired effect. By leveraging the distributed availability group, another benefit is we're only sending the transactions from our primary replica to our forwarding replica in the, you know, the target AG. So once the, tar the forwarding replica receives those transactions, it locally sends those transactions to the other replicas in the new AG. So consideration when you're talking about you know, going across wires from data center to cloud, and just another consideration to have there. So another offering we have is our quick starts. So a quick start is our SA community has put together um, cloud formation, cloud formation being our infrastructure as scriptable infrastructure for creating our creating resources. And they put together for in this example, always on availability groups, what's our best practice? You know, when, when we recommend to a customer how to configure always on availability groups within AWS, this is what we recommend. So we've created these cloud formation templates that allow you to go into the you know go into the console and just use this script to stand up this whole environment. This is a production ready best practice you know from the AWS SA community and in a little over an hour you have a fully functioning production ready system. What are the use cases here? Well, if you don't have a production presence in AWS and for whatever reason some kind of a migration maybe your timeline has been accelerated for some unknown piece and all of a sudden you need to get production migrated. Um, in this scenario, you can use this quick start to give you a landing zone in AWS that's production ready. Um, conversely, you could use this as a baseline. You could create the quick start template and create the have always on availability group and then edit it to meet your own internal corporate best, stand, best practices and standards and you know, have that as your target for a migration. Or the third scenario is an educational option where you can take perhaps that cloud formation document itself, kind of cherry pick the elements that you would like to use in your own cloud formation template for your own infrastructure, and then you know, discard the rest. Or you can stand up the whole environment and then reverse engineer that environment, determine you know, what has been done, you know, use the documentation that comes with the quick start to determine why things were done. And then when you're done with that learning opportunity, you can just delete the environment. And your, your only costs are however long it remained in place while you were doing your educational components. So pretty powerful, pretty um, good. And so this is an always on availability group stand example. The quick starts are also there for other members of Exchange, SharePoint, other Microsoft stacks as well. So this is just one example appropriate to the SQL Server migration effort as a target, but you know, lots of other options out there for the quick start. So SQL 2008, 2008 R2, it's still out there. I probably have multiple conversations per week with customers that are still running on production on 2008 and 2008 R2 and looking to migrate those off. So I wanted to, you know, have a specific shout out. Obviously, it's you know, it's extended support has already expired over a year ago, um, but you still need to consider it. So if you're looking to do the direct upgrade, you know, 2012 through 2017 and the production supported models, I'm assuming you have the right service packs for 2008 and 2008 R2. When you're analyzing those, make sure you understand your compatibility levels. You know, is there a reason it's set lower for some application vendor support? You know, if it isn't and you can lift it, make sure you do the appropriate testing to support that migration success. And then when you're finding it at home, use the, the, the information and the tooling we've already talked about today to determine, is this a good candidate for RDS? Is this a good candidate for EC2? And when you determine where that workload needs to move to, you know, what are the migration strategies that make sense? And we've got a few listed on this slide, but we're going to jump into a couple others as well. So SQL 2008 still out there, still actively being used. You know, we do want to say that it does have a home in AWS, you know, an RDS or EC2. So let's, you know, keep, keep that conversation moving. So AWS tools and services, other options above and beyond what SQL offers you to migrate your data into AWS. So the first tool I want to talk about is Cloud Endure. So this is a free service. Um, you only, you're only going to be paying for the resources you're creating in terms of storage and such. Um, so this is an agent-based based solution, meaning that when you're defining your source, your source could be uh, you know, a physical machine in your corporate data center. 
if you can install, you know, if you can get to the OS, install an agent, it's a valid source. It could also be a, a virtual machine. It could be a VMware or Hyper-V, even Azure. You know, we have a number of options there to support. And as long as you can get to the OS and install that agent, it's a valid source. When you're configuring it, you you know, so you define your sources and then you initiate a copy of the underlying data within the storage and then it switches to a block level replication to keep that data in sync or near in sync with production. How it does that is through a staging area. Now the staging area is, you know, we're calling it lightweight. The reason we're calling it that is because there's really not a compute presence there. We're just copying the underlying blocks to our lower cost EBS block storage. Um, and then we have a small EC2 presence to actually just handle the actual replication effort itself. But there's really no compute, there's no licensing considerations because we're not running Windows, we're not running SQL Server, we're just doing a block level you know, disk replication. Once it's in the staging area, then it also generates a blueprint. So the blueprint is a document that the orchestration tool, which is the next part of Cloud Endure, when you're ready to go live, the orchestration tool reads the blueprint to determine, okay, for server one, I need this EC2 instance type. I need this tier of storage. It's going to subnet X. So the blueprint is allows you to go in and edit, okay, this application needs high-end data you know, um, storage. This can get away with lower storage. You can really define how the final target EC2 machines are going to look. And then when you're ready, you can use the orchestration tool to bring those machines online. Now, it's a parallel effort. So if we had 100 machines running, you know, being prepared in that staging area, all 100 would come online in a parallel effort. So usually in under a minute, we're gonna see those machines coming online, following the blueprint definition with the appropriate storage tier at networking, et cetera. Um, now for, this is a great solution for standalone boxes, you know, with local attached disk um, or drive attached disk. If you have machines that are running high availability, so perhaps it's a failable cluster instance with shared storage. Perhaps it's a, you know, availability group with local storage, um, but also a cluster component. When you're looking to migrate those objects, there are some considerations. If you're using availability groups, it's local storage, so the Cloud Endure agent will recognize that storage and replicate it across, but it's not going to recognize it's part of a HA configuration. And when you bring that machine up on the AWS side, you're gonna to have to do some additional configuration to make that live. You're gonna to have to destroy the cluster that was there before, you know, rebuild the cluster. So there are a number of additional elements that make it less desirable for a, a very short-term cutover. Um, so there are better options if you want that. Now, with the shared storage, if the disk is being presented as a drive letter so the OS can see it, then Cloud Endure, again, can see the storage, it can replicate it, but it doesn't know that it's shared storage. So it's going to, bringing up as a standalone box effectively. So then you have the same considerations. You have to destroy the cluster, do a number of additional steps. Um, so that is considerations. Um, on the licensing side, when you're bringing a SQL Server workload in through Cloud Endure, it's going to assume you're bringing your own license. Um, if, you, if that is not the case and you need to do some kind of a license included model, that's gonna be an additional step after the migration strategy. So you need to you know, take account of that. And you know if you have very low cutover times, and there are gonna be better solutions we've potentially already talked about or are about to talk about to handle those HA considerations when you're doing the cloud engineer. But again, free service, you're only paying for the storage you're incurring in your staging area, you know, and the EC2 instance for the replication. So very lightweight footprint, um, and say so it comes online pretty quick, so it's a very close to, you know, close to near real-time go-live strategy for your migration effort. And it is block level, agent-based. So here's a different tool that is not agent-based. So this is our server migration service, and this is an agentless solution. So it's focused towards um, virtualization because it uses snapshots as part of its process. So if you're running VMware, Hyper-V, you know, Microsoft Azure Virtual Machines, um, those are all valid source for the server migration service. You cannot put this on a know, a physical machine in your data center because it's leveraging the snapshot technology of the hypervisor. So when you define which machines you want, you can create groupings. You can say, okay, this is my HR application. Here's my data tier, here's my web tier, here's my app tier. And you can define all those different machines as part of a group. 
and then within that group you can define what your you know your snapshot generation is going to be and how that's going to drive the next step so it could be once every 24 hours to as much as once every hour once it generates those snapshots it's going to use us to create an amazon machine image an ami and it's also going to generate a cloud formation template that's going to leverage that ami to create a new ec2 instance so this is being driven by the most recent snapshot so it's not a real-time cutover um, so be aware of that, you know, Cloud and Jira is a better fit if you need a shorter term cutover, or if you can accept the snapshot schedule, then, you know, Silver Migration Service might be a good fit. Now, with that process, again, if we're looking at machines that are part of a high availability, the same considerations may be, may be there, you know, the destroying the cluster and starting over. There are some additional steps that, you know, may make this a good fit or not. But you know, for non-production systems where maybe the data, data, data change isn't as often, you know, they probably maybe don't have a HA consideration, you know, this server migration service, the cloud engineer are all great, great fits for that kind of a migration effort. So another program we have is our EMP, which is our end of support migration program for Windows. So this is for our legacy apps. So if you've got a machine that's running on Windows 2003, you know, up through, through 2008 or two, um, and an example I would use here is SQL 2000. If you try and install SQL 2000 on a server 2019 box, it's not gonna be, you know, supported and model. So what the EMP solution does, it, it can be downloaded and run, you know, by yourselves as a self-service option, or it can be leveraged in coordination with our partners and our you know, professional services organizations to help. But what it does is it does an analysis of the software. Maybe you don't have the media anymore, or maybe you, you know, maybe it's a package that you bought and you've lost the, you know, the media or such. It evaluates the runtime engines. You know, what legacy runtimes does it need to operate? And when it collects all those data pieces, it creates a package that you can take and put onto your current generation operating system. So you now you have a you know, current generation that's being patched, security patches, you know, there's no extended support model because you're running an old version of SQL. So you can take that program, that package that acts as an interim step between the legacy OS it's designed to run on and the new supported OS that it can run on with this package supporting it. And effectively that allows you the ability in this example to use SQL 2000, you know, running on modern OS. Um, so if that's uh, your need for a specific application that you have to run 2000, that's an option to do so. Now, this is just an example using SQL 2000. We could use application software. You know, this, this product is all about giving you the support of legacy applications on modern OS. So SQL 2000 was my example, but there are other, other options that are not necessarily database focused or, and such. So that's our EMP program. So what about, you know, I've talked about database, database migration service a couple times here and also a schema conversion tool. Now, what are they? So database migration service is our means of migrating the actual data at the table level um, and also, you know, to warehouses. The schema conversion tool is if you're looking to do a more of a modernization conversation where you actually need to change data types, you know, schema changes, you know, metadata considerations, other things that you would need to do if you're going from SQL Server to say MySQL, or Amazon Aurora. So the considerations, uh, this is database migration service. Like I said, 300,000 databases migrated and counting. So this is a, you know, a very mature product that we've, you know, a lot of customers have used. So what are the areas for the database migration service? Well, this is a tool that kind of crosses the migration slash modernization conversation. On the migration side, it can be used. Uh, the database migration service is a, a native AWS offering that allows you to, you know, circumvent some version restrictions that are, you know, prevent you from taking a 2008 backup and restoring it to 2019. With database migration service, we're actually going to be using, you know, table level, just the data itself. So that allows us to, you know, circumvent version restrictions if that's what we need, or if we have you know, perhaps a large wealth of historical data that doesn't need to be moved into AWS and you're just gonna archive it for historical purposes. We can use DMS to determine what slice of our data needs to move across and we can migrate that across. Typically, you know, for most use cases, there are better offerings such as, you know, a native backup and restore. There's some of the other tools we've talked about today for a SQL Server to SQL Server restore. But if you're looking to do 
other engines of a modernization conversation, this can be a great tool for you know, migrating. Now, replication is the second piece of DMS, Database Migration Service. You know, obviously you're familiar with, you know, if you want to use read replicas within availability groups, that's an enterprise feature. We do offer that within RDS, but it's still an enterprise feature. If we want to stand up a read replica you know, outside of that scope, we can use the database migration service to push our data to a standard edition database, perhaps. Um, it can be in the same region. We can use it cross region. So the replication aspect of database migration services allows us to you know, leverage standard edition, not be you know, hampered by enterprise requirements. And we can also use it to synchronize our lower environments. We have a lot of options on the replication level. Now the modernization piece, you know, in conjunction with the schema conversion tool, if you're looking to move your commercial SQL Server footprint into an open source or an Amazon Aurora, or maybe a data warehouse such as Redshift, these are all tools that are at your disposal when you leverage the database migration service. So here's a, an example of how this would look, a fairly simple rudimentary example. We have our application users, their connection to our database on the customer side. So first step we need to do is create that replication instance. You now that's that small Linux EC2 box that's gonna handle the replication tasks we're gonna create within DMS. Then we need to define our source and our target. In this situation, you know, source is on the corporate data center side, our target is in AWS, and we're gonna create that definition. Then we're gonna create a task that says, okay, this is the tables, this is the schema level, this is the, you know, these are the databases we wanna migrate from our source to our target. So we're identifying what specifically data we want to move. Then once we identify that, DMS does an initial load of that data into the AWS target. And then after it does the initial load, it switches for, for SQL Server to a change data capture approach to migrate the, just, the just the changing records to AWS to keep that data you know, near real time in sync. So as we move forward and we've done that, then we can take our application users, you know, disconnect them from the customer database and on-prem, reattach them to the um, AWS database, you know, change the connection string, and then the application is live on AWS. You know, we let the any in-flight transactions complete and our migration is over using that database migration system. And that could be whether we're going from the same platform to the same platform or to a different database engine. Now, what else can we do here with DMS? So in this scenario, you know, if you have you know, a number of acquisitions, you have maybe a number of different um, inventory systems or facility master databases, this could be a great opportunity to leverage creating multiple sources, but importing them all into a single target. So consolidating your data um, or conversely the reverse. If you have a monolith where you've got a lot of applications that databases that all live in the same footprint, but it rarely don't need to, you can leverage the database migration service to push those different individual subsets of data into separate targets. And these targets don't need to be the same database engine. We could perhaps migrate two of the three to SQL Server, um, but the third target could be you know, Amazon Aurora, you know, a different database engine. So you have the ability to merge, you know, break out, break in, and use different database engine platforms as part of a, you know, a database migration strategy. This is some of the sources. Um, just to give you a, an example of the, the level of you know, different engines you can use as part of your source. Um, there are some different version compatibilities, so this is always, you know, we, we have support for Amazon, Amazon SQL Database as a full load. We have a support for S3 as part of a, you know, a full data load as well. So we've got a number of sources. And then conversely, on the target side, you see a similar footprint. So this is our data move from point A to point B. But what I also wanna talk about with DMS is this additional functionality that kind of separate sets it aside from perhaps transactional replication, which seems to be a similar use case. But here with database migration services, we're also exposing other tools. So we have access to export that data into Redshift, which is our data warehouse. We can drop those as flat files into S3 as part of maybe a data lake initiative. Um, or we can also push some subset of that data into a DynamoD, DynamoDB configuration or a DocumentDB. You know, we can really, as we look at our SQL Server workload, we can determine you know, this piece of the data 
lends itself well to maybe a NoSQL solution. This piece maybe lends itself to a document DB solution. Or, you know, Kinesis data streams if we're trying to feed this data into another AWS service down the road. So the DMS, you know, value add here is above and beyond the ability to move data from point A to point B. We also have support for a lot of other, you know, AWS native targets that really expand your migration conversation and give you a lot more options. So the schema conversion tool is part of our modernization path. If you're looking to, you know, you have an existing application, you can download your schema conversion tool and run it against your own workloads and determine what's the complexity. It's gonna look at your schema, your metadata. You know, if you define your source, maybe SQL Server, your target being, I don't know, Amazon Aurora, and it can determine, okay, what data type mismatches are we gonna have? Um, what func function differences? What, how do we need to implement our business logic? It's also going to assess, if you want it to, your actual application source code. If you have hard-coded T-SQL in there, it can recognize that and then offer you know, conversion options there also. As part of this whole process, it comes up with uh, a, you know, a migration report effectively that says, for this specific workload, I def you know, the complexity is here. And you can run the same you know, conversion tool against multiple different workloads and determine what the complexity is for each one. And this can be a great conversation of, you know, we have multiple workloads we want to migrate. Do we prioritize the easiest first? Do we prioritize the most complex first? So we can use that assessment to really understand, you know, what we're getting into in terms of complexities. And, you know, the outcome of that is this interface where we can, where we can see, you know, the individual issues that have been identified um, and then any remediations it recommends um, but also at the actual procedure level, you can see on the left side there, we've determined that this, this specific code is an issue, but you can go and edit it on the right side. The whole end product of the Schema Conversion Tool Interactive IDI is that we want to be able to get to a new target database. So here in step one, we're gonna use our Schema Conversion Tool to create a, a skeleton database, an empty database that has all the right data types, our business logic has been implemented, any functions that we need to adjust, they're all there. So as the end of step one, we have our empty database. And then in step two, we use our database migration service and, and any data conversions that need to occur to deposit that data into our new target that we created in step one. So that's how we use our schema conversion tool to do the you know, data, you know, the metadata conversion. And then we use database migration services to do actual, actual the data move. So some of the resources around these tools, um, I've included the technical docs here. These are a great resource um, for looking at more about database migration service and also the schema conversion tool. Um, I have here the link to download the schema conversion tool. As I spoke to earlier, you can you know, pull that down and run it against your own systems to determine you know, complexities and such. So that is something you can self-service in terms of the assessment. We also have our migration playbooks. So migration playbooks are a huge resource. There are hundreds of pages of going from you know, SQL to MySQL, for example. The, and the conversation here is, you know, going from SQL Server to MySQL is not an unknown science. Plenty of DBAs have gone through this process before. There are a lot of lessons learned out there. And this migration playbook is an attempt to document those lessons learned. So if you're going through the same migration, and uh, you know the schema conversion tool says you know you got to see this issue, or you run into other problems. The playbook could be a great resource. Okay, I'm hitting error number one, two, three. Let's go look at the playbook. It says okay, that means X, and here's the remediation we recommend. So very valuable um, to you know make that migration experience less painful, a little faster, and you know leverage what other people have done before you. Um, and additionally, the forms are a great add to that as well. Obviously we have our support system as well, but the forums where the community is out there, they're also doing the same events that you are. Just another, another set of resources you're exposed to, to understand you know, what the problems are and what potential resolutions are out there. So those are some of the resources. So we've talked a number, about a number of different solutions here. Here's just kind of a summation of those migration methods, you know, as appropriate. We've also identified, you know, additions we're using, you know, versions we're using. We understand our, our skill set, you know, what is our what are our core strengths within our internal team. And when we understand all those different elements, then we can decide which migration tool, uh, which you know, target strategy, target architecture, 
best meets all those needs. And that allows us to, you know, as part of that assessment we talked about initially, understand the migration path forward and the best fit for our workloads. So as we're moving on here, I also wanted to talk about some of the other sessions before I move into our question and answer period here. There are some other sessions that I would strongly encourage you to view. Uh, we have a session by uh, Eugene here, who's gonna talk in great more depth about our managed RDS solution. And then we also have Richard, who's gonna talk about business intelligence on our Amazon RDS. So those are both two great sessions that I you know, strongly encourage you to visit and you know, watch as well. Um, additionally, we have our virtual booths. We have a lot of our AWS Microsoft experts, you know, they're in the booths to help you through video chat if you have any questions about anything you've seen in any session or just questions about Microsoft and AWS in general. Um, those are great resources for you to leverage if you wanna have you know, further dialogue with any of our resources. So with that, I'm gonna open up the floor to our Q&A period and thank you for your time.